Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless there are dark and ominous clouds on the horizon news headlines are ramping up bible prophecy is running at breakneck speed we can no longer ignore this serious and immediate danger right now we are witnessing a proxy war between russia and nato powers the chinese continue to make preparations to invade taiwan and when that day arrives the United States and China will instantly be in a state of war. But I believe that there is another major conflict that is even more imminent. Israel and Iran are rapidly approaching an inflection point over Tehran's nuclear program. It is very likely Israel will attack Iran, fulfilling a Bible prophecy found in Jeremiah chapter 49. The birth pains are increasing at a speed that should alarm everyone and light a fire in all our hearts and minds to not only get ready for Jesus' return, but to tell everyone we know the good news of the gospel. Jude 123. But others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3 Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. This prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. We want to begin this half hour in Israel where protests against the government's judicial reform plan are reaching into many areas of society, including the country's military. CBN News Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl brings us this look at the impact this could have on Israel's national security. As part of the protests, thousands of IDF reservists are threatening to refuse serving. This comes at a time when tensions between Israel and Hezbollah are on the rise. Hezbollah leaders have mocked what they see as Israel's internal weakness, stemming from months of protests, including from within the military. It's inspired the Iranian-backed group to raise tensions along Israel's border with Lebanon. So what we feel there is an attack, an attack from inside, and we feel it's much more dangerous than any other attack. Lieutenant Colonel Ron Scherf helps lead Brothers in Arms and began protesting this policy back in February. So far, thousands of military reservists, including senior officers and pilots, are joining the organization's pledge to refuse military reserve duty. Israel's defense is built on the spirit, not only on the weapons and the number of soldiers. And this spirit is being torn apart by Netanyahu and his government. The IDF's chief of staff responded that Israel remains prepared for any military challenge. Days of dispute and crisis require an emphasis on what we have in common and what unite us, the mission of defending the state of Israel. Certain military experts blame the reservists for crossing a line that shouldn't be crossed. It's devastating because, you know, it's involving politics in the army, 
It's something that shouldn't be done in terms of security. Reserve Brigadier General Amir Avivi says, while individuals have refused to serve in the past, this time is different. We've never seen a phenomena where ex-chief of staff generals basically backing up the idea of insubordination. It's unbelievable. It's completely against our core values. It's against our Zionistic values. It's against the values of the army. Reserve Colonel Kobe Marom, a former commander in northern Israel, fears Hezbollah could try to take advantage of the situation and make a foolish move. It's not just the Hezbollah and the Iranians. They look to the situation and say the Israelis are crazy. They're fighting each other. The government don't have any tension to deal with other security issues. That's the opportunity. Let's, let's use it. It's not only hurting the army. It's really, really endangering Israel and might bring uh, us on the verge of war. The Israeli premier went on to discuss the threat which the Islamic Republic of Iran represents to the world and the need to produce a credible military threat to Iran and to use that threat if the Islamic Republic defiantly pursues nuclear weapon capabilities. Netanyahu stressed, quote, We don't want a world in which Iran can threaten New York or Washington or Los Angeles or anything in between with nuclear weapons. Certainly, we're not going to have one in which they could annihilate Israel, which they call a one-bomb country. It's an abhorrent statement, but it tells you where they are. The Israeli Prime Minister went on to stress that Israel will do everything in its power with or without a diplomatic agreement to defend itself. Turning to Israel's northern border with Lebanon, where Israeli Defense Minister Yav Gallant held an extensive security assessment with the IDF's northern command amid the highest recorded tensions with the Iranian proxy Hezbollah since the days that preceded the Second Lebanon War. I arrived this morning to our northern border, to the Sian Hardaf sector, for the purpose of following closely the latest developments. The enemy must understand that when we're talking about Israel's security, we are all united and I warn Hezbollah and Nasrallah not to make a mistake. You've made mistakes in the past, you paid a heavy costs. If, God forbid, this area will escalate or combat incidents, we will return Lebanon to the Stone Age. We will not hesitate to utilize all of our power and we will grind through every meter of Hezbollah and Lebanon if we are forced to do so. Don't make mistakes. We do not want war, but we are prepared to defend our citizens, our soldiers, and our sovereignty. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah prophesied Israel would have a powerful military. Zechariah 12.6 In that day I will make the governors of Judah like a fire pan in the woodpile and like a fiery torch in the sheaves. They shall devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left, but Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, Jerusalem. Also in the Middle East, the United States is increasing its military presence in the region. More than 3,000 Marines arrived in the area this week. Their mission to help dissuade Iran from seizing and interfering with merchant ships in the Strait of Hormuz. After two years of attempts at diplomacy, the U.S. is now making a strong show of force. While the U.S. may not be directly involved in any major regional conflict, tensions with Iran are only increasing. The Islamic regime continues to launch attacks on a key shipping route, in addition to ramping up its nuclear program. Escalations that now demand a renewed American presence in the region. The best way to avoid war is strength. Reagan said it best, peace through strength. Thousands of Marines backed by U.S. fighter jets and warships are deploying to the Persian Gulf, a display of military might that's long overdue, according to Nathan Sales, former ambassador at large and coordinator for counterterrorism in the Trump administration. What Iran has seen so far from the administration is one after another episodes of turning the other cheek. That's a great way to live your life as a, as a private citizen and as a Christian. That's not a great way to run foreign policy. The latest slap involves the regime increasing its pattern of harassing and seizing ships traveling through the Strait of Hormuz, the waterway that more than 20 percent of the world's oil must pass through. With Iran now closer than ever to weapons-grade uranium levels, the Biden administration has finally admitted efforts to revive a nuclear deal are done, and that option is no longer on the table. I think the important question for us to be asking the White House is, 
what took you so long? It's not as if Iran has been dramatically worsening its behavior lately. This is all par for the course. We've looked the other way for a good two and a half years. Along with this military show of force, Gabriel Nerona, former State Department Special Advisor for Iran, says the administration is still offering Iran concessions giving the regime an impression that it holds the leverage in nuclear negotiations. The State Department is still trying to negotiate something where they uh, give sanctions relief to Iran in exchange for Iran uh, pausing its enrichment or, or doing a little bit less there. Narona tells CBN News that while China may be the administration's top priority, the U.S. response to Iran could make a major difference in how Beijing moves forward. If the United States sets a red line over Iranian nuclear uh, activity, um, that better be something that we're willing to actually enforce uh, because the results, if we don't enforce that red line, could be a completely green light to China to go and invade Taiwan. Since the beginning of the year, we've also seen an increase in joint military exercises between the U.S. and Israel. Turning to Israel's northern neighbor, Syria, where at least four Syrian soldiers were killed and a dozen other sustained wounds. When at approximately 2.20 a.m. overnight, missiles penetrated Syrian airspace and struck multiple targets in the vicinity of the capital, Damascus. The incoming projectiles were said to have had originated in the Golan Heights, which drew Syria to conclude that Israel was behind the attack. And while Syria's aerial defense array was triggered in an attempt to intercept the incoming projectiles, all of the intended targets reportedly sustained devastating blows. Meanwhile, in spite of Syria pointing a blaming finger at Israel, the IDF spokesperson's unit did not confirm or deny its alleged involvement. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. The prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of these future military conflicts in Isaiah 17.1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. Isaiah 17, 1 and 14, the burden against Damascus. Behold, Damascus will cease from being a city, and it will be a ruinous heap. Then behold, at eventide, trouble, and before the morning, he is no more. This is the portion of those who plunder us, and the lot of those who rob us. Isaiah 17, 9. In that day his strong cities will be as a forsaken bow and an uppermost branch, which they left because of the children of Israel, and there will be desolation. Isaiah 17, 1 and 14 tell us Damascus will be destroyed in a single night. Verse 9 suggests it is the children of Israel who caused this desolation, possibly with a nuclear weapon. A long forgotten prophecy that has recently been rediscovered by Bill Salas may enlighten us about the fate of Iran's current nuclear aspirations as we read in Jeremiah 49, 34-39. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the foremost of their might. In this prophecy, Jeremiah predicts that Iran will suffer the fate of a broken bow, which might imply that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps will be unable to launch scores of its missiles at its enemies. Additionally, he declares that Iran will be struck at the foremost place of its might, which today could infer an attack upon its nuclear program. One of Iran's most strategic and vulnerable nuclear targets is the Boucher nuclear reactor, located in the heart of ancient Elam. Jeremiah continues in verses 36 and 37. Against Elam I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven, and scatter them toward all those winds, there shall be no nations where the outcasts of Elam will not go. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies and before those who seek their life. I will bring disaster upon them, my fierce anger, says the Lord, and I will send the sword after them until I have consumed them. Jeremiah informs that the attack upon the ancient territory of Elam will produce numerous refugees, perhaps even turning into a humanitarian crisis. Exiles will be dispersed worldwide as if being blown about by overpowering winds. In addition to the Lord, Iran has enemies in this prophecy. Israel seeks to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear nation. Additionally, Jeremiah says that Iran has fiercely angered the Lord 
and that provokes the Lord to cause a severe disaster inside of Iran. Perhaps this alludes to a nuclear disaster caused from a strike upon Iran's Boucher nuclear reactor. Jeremiah's last two verses present the exiles of Jeremiah 49:36 with great news. I will set my throne in Elam, and will destroy from there the king and the princes, says the Lord. But it shall come to pass in the latter days, I will bring back the captives of Elam, says the Lord. Iranians who accept Christ in advance of his second coming will be returned from global exile into the restored fortunes of their historic homeland in Elam. Moreover, Jerusalem and Elam are the only two earthly locations identified in Scripture for the future establishment of the Lord's throne. As we get closer to the rapture, the tribulation, and the second coming of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit will reveal to students of Bible prophecy the relevance of additional overlooked prophecies concerning the end times. Is the prophecy of Elam one of those prophecies? There is a prophecy written by Asaph the seer that many end time teachers believe has yet to find fulfillment. In this prophecy, a confederation of Muslim nations have taken crafty counsel against the Jewish people in Israel in order to destroy them as we read in Psalm 83, 1-8. Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace and do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult, and those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gabal, Ammon and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre, Assyria also has joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot. Ezekiel 38, 1-9 The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords. Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his hordes, Beth Garma from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes, Many peoples are with you. Be ready and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be mustered. In the latter years you will go against the land that is restored from war, the land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. You will advance, coming on like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your hordes and many peoples with you. These are the modern day nations listed in Ezekiel 38 and 39 who will be mustered in the latter years to attack Israel, Russia, Iran, Turkey, Libya, Sudan, and Ethiopia. God tells us exactly what will happen to Iran, Russia, Turkey, and the many peoples with you when they attack Israel in Ezekiel 38, 18 through 23, and 39 to 7 and 8. And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him into judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And I will turn thee back, and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name any more. Then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming, and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. I've been informed by top-ranking military officials that Israel has been unable to launch even a single plane in defense. As I stand here, Fighter planes are exploding in midair. They're crashing and falling to the ground without any explanation. And while no one can seem to give me any reason for why this is happening, I can tell you this. 
This all-out, unprecedented attempt to destroy Israel appears to be failing. God is the one who fights this battle for Israel. He does it for two reasons. To make his holy name known in the midst of his people Israel, that the nation shall know that he is the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Zechariah 2, 8, 9 For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoiled for their servants. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Israel is precious to Almighty God, the apple of his eye. He is simply saying, You touch my chosen nation Israel, you poke me in the eye. Is Vladimir Putin, the infamous Gog of Magog, that the prophet Ezekiel warned would come on the scene in the last days and lead a coalition of nations to destroy Israel? Or could Gog be Recep Tayyip Erdogan, another dictator who is fast gaining power and dominance in the Middle East? Biblical scholars can't agree if the prophet Ezekiel was talking about a last day's assault on Israel being led by Russia or Turkey. Many popular Bible teachers claim that Gog will come from Russia, while others claim that Ezekiel's prophecy actually points to Turkey. Whether Gog is from Russia or Turkey, both nations are presently being led by undisputed dictators who could each very easily fit the Gog profile. In the war in Ukraine, two devastating Russia, Russian missile strikes on the center of a city in the east of the country killed at least seven people and injured more than 70. The attack came a day after Ukraine revealed what it said was an assassination plot against President Zelensky. Nearly half of those wounded are Ukrainian fire and rescue workers. Emergency services rushed to the site of that first explosion, not knowing that a second missile was about to hit. Stunned and staring at this apartment, its walls crumbling right after Russia's strike, residents of the town of Pokrovsk now turned rescuers, scrambled to help people sprawled on the ground. The flames filled my eyes, said this bruised woman. I fell on the floor, there's shrapnel in my neck. The window fell on me, said her neighbor. I've got cuts on my back, knee and legs. Part of the Hotel Druzhba, meaning friendship, was also smashed, used by many journalists covering this war, including our own CBS News colleagues just in June, who sheltered in the hotel basement as a missile exploded outside. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky said Russia is trying to leave only broken and scorched stones, adding we have to stop Russian terror. And new this morning, Ukraine counterintelligence revealed the arrest of three more Ukrainian women, also from the district of Pokrovsk, alleged to be part of a Russian agent network. Transmitting movements of combat aircraft and armored vehicles. That claim just one day after the spy agency said another Ukrainian woman had gathered intel on Zelensky's July schedule to Mykolaiv, a city near the southeast front line, for a possible assassination attempt and, quote, massive airstrike on the region. Ukraine security services says those women were a sleeper cell waiting to be woken up since even before the war started. Matthew 24, 6 and 7. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Nation is the Greek word ethnos, which means a race, as of the same habit, i.e. a tribe, especially a foreign, non-Jewish one, Gentiles, usually by implication, pagan. What I believe Jesus is saying here is that there have always been wars and rumors of wars. But when you see the same ethnic group fighting the same ethnic group, now pay attention. His return is near. The bodies of fallen soldiers litter the streets of this Khartoum suburb, evidence of the fierce battles of recent days. The Sudanese army is ramping up its offensive in its attempts to regain control of the capital, largely held by the rapid support forces. Several neighborhoods targeted by airstrikes and shelling have been evacuated. Civilians are facing a dire situation. The vast majority of hospitals across the country are not operational and medicine is scarce. We've lost the medication supply chain, so the medicines you see on the shelves are the entire stock. In fact, almost all daily medicines are in short supply. The UN says four million people have been forced from their homes since the conflict began in April. These families from the Darfur region, another major site of fighting, are fleeing groups linked to the rapid support forces. We've lost everything. They left us with nothing. It doesn't matter if you're men or women, 
They just kill everyone. They're making their way to the western border in the hopes of crossing to safety in neighboring Chad, joining hundreds of thousands of Sudanese refugees already in the camps there. But while they might be safe from violence, they're fleeing to uncertainty. Uh, the situation is, um, is uh, deteriorating in terms of uh, food security, in terms of the economic uh, deterioration, and also uh, from a nutrition uh, perspective. Refugee agencies are trying to move people away from the border areas, but Chad is already struggling with its own humanitarian crisis. A third of the population needs assistance. The streets of Niger's capital, Niamey, remain calm, but the military coup leaders show no sign of backing down. Instead, announcing more new officials to replace the government of democratically elected President Mohamed Barazoum, who they have held in detention since July the 26th. The President of the National Council for the Safeguarding of the Homeland, Head of State, decrees Article 1, Mr. Lamine Zain Ali Mohammed is appointed Prime Minister. All diplomatic efforts at finding a peaceful solution to the crisis have so far failed. In its latest response, the military junta said it had refused entry to a delegation from the African Union, the UN and the regional bloc ECOWAS because of security concerns. This only hours after the acting U.S. Deputy Secretary of State, Victoria Newland, said she had held two hours of difficult talks with the self-appointed defense minister and had been refused access to Niger's detained leader. ECOWAS is struggling to pull together a military force comprised of soldiers from member states which it has threatened to use as a last resort in a potential military operation to reinstate the deposed Nigerian president. Nigeria's president, Bola Tinubu, is the new chairman of ECOWAS. Nigeria, with by far the biggest army in the region, would be expected to take the lead in any such military operation. But President Tinubu is facing opposition from Nigerian MPs, including those in his own party and his people, who fear the considerable risk of sparking a wider regional war. And if that were to happen, it could lead to a deterioration in the already difficult fight against armed groups like Boko Haram, ISIL and Al-Qaeda. The refusal by Niger's coup leaders to allow entry into the country by a combined United Nations, African Union and ECOWAS delegation comes two days before a second emergency ECOWAS summit on the crisis. It's expected the focus of that summit will be discussions about a potential last resort military solution. The diplomatic avenues are still open, but there are fears that they are becoming increasingly slim. It seems as though we are on the verge of World War III. Jesus told us in the last days there would be war between the nations. Are we seeing the stage setting taking place to fulfill this prophecy? If so, then we're close to the time Jesus refers to as the worst time in the history of the world as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. If we are that close to the tribulation, then the world is about to see war the likes of this planet has never seen before. The book of Revelation tells us when Jesus breaks the first seal, the Antichrist will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the second seal, war will be unleashed. Resulting from these wars will be famine, pestilence, and death as Jesus breaks the third and fourth seals. The Bible tells us 25% of the population of the earth will be killed at this time as we read in Revelation 6, 8. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The population of the world is roughly 8 billion, meaning 2 billion people will die during this time. The remaining 17 judgments of God include devastating earthquakes, cosmic disturbances, scorching heat, meteors, 100-pound hailstones, volcanic eruptions, loathsome sores on those who take the mark of the beast, the seas, rivers, and springs of water turn to blood, demons torturing mankind, and a 200 million strong demonic army who will kill another third of mankind, bringing the total to 4 billion. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, 
But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.